John chapter 8, verse number 32. The Bible reads, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And I want to preach today for a few minutes on this title, The Truth Will Make You Free. The Truth Will Make You Free. Uh, there are many in this room today that have lived under great weights for a long time. And this season has complicated and frustrated and you're weary, you're frustrated, your mind is under attack. And I tell you today, the truth will make you free. Would you lift up your hands one more time? Lord Jesus, we submit ourselves to you. We submit ourselves to your word now. We pray that there would be a power and a demonstration of your spirit. I pray deliverance into this room right now. I pray deliverance into every mind, into every heart. I pray deliverance into every family and every home. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, let the Holy Spirit fall in this house. Let the power of the Most High God move among us and bring deliverance and strength and healing and joy. Lord, we turn our eyes from everything that could distract us, and we fix our eyes upon You, for You are the answer. You are the source of every good thing. You are our help and our strength. And we call on You now. We invite You into this place, into our hearts, to speak and to move by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. One more time, would you clap your hands to the Lord? Hallelujah. Praise be to God. I love you, Jesus. I worship you, O oh God. Hallelujah. The Lord bless you. You can be seated. The truth will make you free. There's a story familiar to many of us, I'm sure you find it in Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse number 46. The Bible's telling the story of a day when Jesus and his disciples come to Jericho. And as they go out to Jericho, as you might suspect, a great number of people have gathered together in the streets, for they've heard that Jesus... This one who does miracles, the one whom great signs and wonders follow his life and ministry. They've heard of him, and now they've gathered to see. The streets are filled with hundreds, if not thousands of people on this day. But the Bible chooses, in the wisdom of God, to identify one character by name. Not only by name, but by issue. The scripture calls this man blind Bartimaeus. Why it could not be just Bartimaeus, I don't know. Couldn't it have been Bartimaeus, the brother, the son, the friend, kind Bartimaeus, loving Bartimaeus. But no, the Lord chooses to allow that writer to identify this man both by his name but also by his issue. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sits on the highway side begging. This is his lot in life. The unfortunate circumstance to which he has been born has caused a certain disability or handicap in life. He can't work like everybody else works. He can't have a job like everybody else has a job. And so his life is at the mercy of the kindness or the compassion of those who pass him by. There's no system for long-term disability. There's no government aid. It's just those moments of kindness and compassion when somebody might pass him by, offer him a little money for the day or bread for a meal. That's how he's accustomed to living. But he senses that this day has the potential to be different than every other day. The Bible says he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. And he begins to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. 
And many begin to charge him, the scripture says, that he should hold his peace. Bartimaeus, it's, you don't need to do that. that. That's uncalled for. That's unnecessary. But the more they pressured him to be silent, he lifts his voice. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they charge him even more that he should hold his peace. But the Bible says he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And if you can imagine in the midst of the hundreds or thousands and the noise and the, the rustling and the bustling on the street and all the commotion, this man is determined to be heard. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And the Bible seems to indicate that Jesus, unwilling to stop for anybody else, stops and stands still at the cry of this man. What was it? Because I would venture a guess today, he was not the only one who had come to see or to hear. He was probably not even the only one calling out for Jesus in this moment. But it's at the voice of this blind Bartimaeus that Jesus stands still that day and calls for the man to be brought to him. What could it possibly be? I, in times past, have preached and maybe you have even heard it was just the, the radical nature of his praise. It was this persistent faith that he was unwilling to let this moment pass him by. But today I submit to you there is more to this than that. For Jesus is called in this text, thou son of David. This is what we would call a messianic term. You've got to understand the significance of this moment. We could go from Genesis to the end of the Old Testament. And the scripture is filled with many, many mighty miracles. God pours out plagues upon Egypt. He parts the waters of the Red Sea. He can make an iron axe head float. He even raises the dead through the ministry of the prophets. The Old Testament is filled with miracles. But there is one miracle you won't find in the Old Testament. You will never find the eyes of the blind being opened. For Isaiah prophesied in 35 and 5 and 6 that when the Messiah comes, the blind will see and the deaf will hear. So you have to understand now what Bartimaeus is saying. He's not just calling on some passing by a miracle worker. He's making a statement about the truth or the identity of who Jesus really is. What he's saying is, I know you're more than just a carpenter. I know you're more than just a prophet from Nazareth. I know you are the Messiah. And the prophets foretold that when Messiah comes, the blind will see and the deaf will hear. So I might have been born with this impairment. I I might have lived with this difficulty, but I know who you are. You are the truth, and it's Bartimaeus's confession of the truth that stops Jesus in his tracks. It's not just the passionate nature of his praise, but it's the declaration of divine truth that captures the attention of Jesus and says, wait a minute. I know there's hundreds here. I know there's thousands who came to see. But there's one person who understands who I am. There's one person whose voice is echoing truth. And it's that truth that enters into the ear of the Lord and captures his heart to call for this man. And now Bartimaeus has given an invitation to stand before the king because of his declaration of truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You know why you feel what you feel in this house today? It's not because there's a newly renovated sanctuary. It's not because there's a beautiful screen and great sounding instruments and talented singers. Why you feel what you feel in this atmosphere is because this is a place where truth is declared. This is a place filled with people where truth is lived. And when you know the truth, the truth shall make you free. But it wasn't enough to know it. Bartimaeus had had to speak on the basis of truth. You shall know the truth 
and the truth shall make you free. I know there's some people in this house today. You weren't born in this. You were born like Bartimaeus, blind and in sin. You came out of a world that had messed you up. You'd messed with drugs and alcohol. Your marriage was in shambles. Your life was a wreck. But in the midst of that, you encountered something when you met somebody from CCC. You encountered something when you stepped into this sanctuary. In spite of all the unusual restrictions, you encountered something. Do you know what it was? It was truth. It was truth. It was truth. And that truth will set you free. It'll break the bondage of every addiction. It'll break the bondage of alcoholism and drug addiction and immorality. It'll mend your marriage. It'll save your kids. It'll deliver you from devils. You know why? Because when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Jesus said in John 14 and 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This isn't a truth that you just get off a bookshelf or you read on CBC or you see scrolling through Facebook. There's a difference between a truth and the truth. And the problem with the circumstances of our present day is we have become distracted by things that are true, but are not the truth. We justify our distraction because it's true. It's a legitimate need. It's a pressing reality. But a truth is not equal to the truth. Jesus is the truth. And the best thing we can do today is recalibrate our vision to take our eyes off everything around us and fix them on Jesus who might just be passing by for you and I like he did for Bartimaeus. Jesus is the truth. You want to know what the answer is for your trouble? Jesus. You want to know what the answer is for the pain and the heartache and the despair and the disappointment? It's Jesus. 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 Say, preacher, is it that simple? Oh, yes, it's really that simple. Jesus is the answer for your family. Jesus is the answer for your marriage. Jesus is the answer for your sickness. Jesus is the answer for your depression. Jesus is the answer for your anxiety. Jesus. But you see, God gave us a message to take us to the man. If you want to encounter the truth, who is Jesus, you get there by the message of truth. That's why Jesus says to Peter, Matthew 16, because you understand who I am. You know the truth. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now, he says, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And then in Luke 24... Jesus says, you're going to go down, beginning at Jerusalem, there'll be a message preached where people from all nations have gathered. It will be a message of repentance and remission of sins in His name, Jesus' name. The only place in the Bible that is fulfilled is in Acts chapter 2. And when the Holy Spirit is poured out and they begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gives them the ability, as you might suspect, some questions are asked. And it should not surprise us that Peter, the one with the keys to the kingdom of heaven, stands up to answer the question or, as it were, open the door to the kingdom so all can come and enter in. But narrow is the way of salvation. You've got to come by the message of truth. And when they asked Peter in Acts 2 and 37, Men and brethren, what shall we do? I hear the preaching of Jesus, that he has been crucified, buried, and rose again. He has ascended into heaven, poured out the promise of the Holy Spirit, which you now see and hear. I feel compelled to respond. Hear me now, because truth always demands a response. 
That's why Bartimaeus can't let this moment pass him by. Because when you know the truth, you are compelled to respond. And so Peter says, here's what you've got to do. You've got to repent of your sin. You've got to turn around. You've got to turn from the world. And you've got to start walking toward God. You've got to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall. It's God's promise to you. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is the message of truth. And where the message of truth is preached, you will meet the man who is truth, Jesus Christ. That's why there's power in this room today. That's why lives are changed in this community and in fellowship with the believers of this great church. Because when you know the truth, the truth shall make you free. But we would be amiss today to overlook the reality that Bartimaeus was facing pressures in his environment. External forces that tried to silence him, tried to stop him. Now, the reality is, is they weren't bad people. They just had a different way of thinking. They thought it should be more decently and in order, and this man was a distraction, and But Bartimaeus knows this is the truth. This is the Messiah. And Isaiah said, when Messiah comes, the blind will see. This is my moment for my life to be changed. And he will not allow the pressure in his environment to stop him in this moment. All of us will be subject to the fight with unwelcome obstacles circumstances we didn't invite and we don't like. But the reality is, is if you know the truth, critics cannot stop you. Circumstances cannot stop you. Because truth demands a response. Watch this. In Genesis chapter 1, we know this. The Bible says the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And in this setting... The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. If you look at those words, it it speaks to us of an environment that is void of order. That is overcome with chaos. That is filled with confusion. For the word of the Lord has not yet brought order and life into this environment. It's one of chaos and confusion. And it's in this environment, God says in Genesis 1 and verse 3. God said, let there be light And there was light. Now I think oftentimes we look at this as if God was speaking to the light to come forth. When in reality, God was speaking to the environment to let the environment know light is coming and there's nothing you can do to stop it. Because light had no beginning. God is light. And the light which comes forth in response to God's word is not the sun and the moon. For that had not yet been created. What God was saying to this environment that was overcome with void and chaos and confusion was let there be light. He was serving notice on that environment that light is coming and there's nothing you can do to stop it. It would be like this morning if somebody, somebody came to rush this platform and Pastor Jack and Pastor Matt jumped up to stop them. And I said, no, let them come. What I'm saying is they have permission. And when God speaks into the atmosphere and says, let there be light, He's saying, I am granting my permission for light to do what it was designed to do. So when the Bible says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, what God is doing 
is by his divine decree serving notice on every circumstance in your life, every struggle in your life, every problem in your life, that it does not have the power to stop you if you've encountered truth. But Pastor Dan, the pressures are so great. And I know the spirit of the Antichrist is working in our day. Daniel prophesied at chapter 7 verse 25. That the spirit of the Antichrist would come seeking to wear out the saints of the Most High God. The prolonged struggle, the constant fight, the the unwavering dynamics that are a weight upon our minds and are, 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 are like a grip upon our faith, suffocating our ability to hear from God and move with the Spirit. But God said and set the pattern in motion at the beginning of creation. When he said, let there be light. That there's nothing that can stop God from being who he is or doing what he desires to do. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. I'm preaching to somebody in this room today who your distraction has caused you unnecessary battles. Your focus on the things of the world and the external pressures has amplified the fight in your mind and your struggling in your faith. But I tell you today, you're in the presence of truth and where truth is, anything can happen. See, sometimes our environments and our circumstances will hinder our ability to receive from God. You look at the story when the disciples are on the boat with Jesus. What is Jesus doing on the other end of that boat? He is sound asleep. He's not bothered by the storm. The circumstances don't trouble him. But you've got the disciples on the other end of the boat. Fearful for their lives that they come and wake him. Master, master, we're perishing. And they ask him, of all things to ask him, they ask him this most ridiculous question. Do you even care? Because storms and circumstances will start messing with your faith. So you think things about God that are not true. Jesus, do you even care that we're about to die? And he does the most amazing thing to me. He gets up, and before he addresses their faith, he, or the storm, he speaks to their faith. Because it's not the storm that Jesus is most concerned with, but it is the faith of his followers. But the storm has a way of messing with your perspective. So you start thinking things about God that are not true. And the problem with that is you have to know the truth if you're going to be made free. And so Jesus begins to speak to their faith. Because it's misplaced faith that really bothers the Lord. It's faith that is not used as it is designed to be used that grieves the heart of God. Because if you know the truth, the truth can make you free. This principle is all through the word of God. You look at the birth of Jesus himself comes to the life of Mary and Joseph and Herod issues a decree. I'm not sure if you've ever considered this, but what could possibly threaten the reign of an earthly king with an entire army at his disposal. I'll tell you what it was. It was the prophecy resting on that child. I know he's only two years old right now, but he will not be two years old forever. And one day there'll come a time When what Isaiah prophesied is really going to happen. And the increase of his kingdom and government, there shall be no end. It'll start where Herod is, but it won't end there. Everywhere he goes, there is that ever advancing kingdom of God. And it's that prophecy that has not yet come to maturity. In fact, Jesus in his humanity has not even yet realized this. But it's that unrealized prophecy that is so 
powerful. It is that truth of God that is so powerful that threatens the reign of Herod that he issues a decree for the slaughter of every male child to and under. What a wicked agenda. And for new parents, it would seem they have every right to be fearful. I mean, if it was your two-year-old child in your arms and you knew the government was coming to take them, you'd have every right to be fearful. And I would venture a guess this morning that most parents in the land were fearful. But Joseph lived in another state. He operated another way. For the Bible tells us it was in the night that an angel of God came to him by dream and gave him a word to go down to Egypt and stay there until God brought him another word. Now hear this, on the surface it might look like he's doing the logical thing. On the surface it might look like he's doing what everybody else is doing. Wouldn't it make sense to flee the land if Herod is trying to kill your child? Certainly it's the logical thing to do. But but he's not operating by human logic. He's not operating by the fear that has permeated the land. He's operating by divine revelation. He has a word from God on what God has said to do and on where God has said to go. And let me tell you the struggle. I've traveled the world in the past few months. Let me tell you the struggle of people everywhere. We are distracted by circumstances beyond our control. External pressures that are making it more difficult. Hear me. I'm not against masks. I'm not against protocol. I'm not against safety. But you can do the right thing with the wrong spirit. We have to be wise. We have to be submitted. We have to be respectful. We don't need to be on anti-government tirades. We, we don't need to be those people. But you hear me. You've got to make sure you're operating by the right word. By the right spirit. You can't allow the circumstances to suffocate your faith so that you are controlled by fear. Because let me tell you where fear comes from. Herod is threatened by the prophecy that's on this child. Herod himself is fearful. And now he projects that fear on those he leads. We know the Bible says fear is not of God. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1 and 7. The power is your ability Love is your motive, and a sound mind is your ability to make a good decision. God has given you a spirit to do what is right with the right motive and make a good decision. And there are some in the camp of the Christian world who have decided they're going to speak ill against leaders and defy them. You see, what they've missed is the motive. But there are some who have complied and respected, but in the process, they have allowed their faith to be suffocated. So they're not being led or operating by the Spirit and by the Word of God. We must do what is right with the right attitude so we can make good decisions. Everybody's fleeing the land, but Joseph is not fleeing in fear. He's fleeing because an angel of God brought him a word from the Lord. You know how you're going to walk in victory through the ever-increasing difficulties of our day. You've got to have a word from God. You've got to know the truth. Because Joseph, it's the truth that will make you free. When you're laying in your bed in the middle of the night and you're wondering, God, what do we do? Is our future in jeopardy? Is my son's life in jeopardy? You don't give in to the fear. You turn your eyes from the circumstances and fix them on Jesus. And you get a word from God. Because it's the truth that will make you free. I could take you to Acts chapter 26 where Paul, Paul has a word from God. He knows he's going to go to Rome. He doesn't know quite how he's going to get there. Who would have thought that God would dare use the orchestration of human government to get him there? 
Who would have thought God would use the circumstances of the prison life to get him there? But he steps foot on that boat with, I think, 276 other prisoners. And the storm starts raging. They have every reason to be afraid because it seems like their life is in jeopardy. But Paul, he knew what to do. He knew where to go. And an angel of God shows up and brings him a word and says, Paul, it's going to be all right. You and everyone with you is going to make it to land safely. And then Paul goes and delivers the word of the Lord to the people. Because this is how this works. When you get a word from God, you've got to make a conscious decision to submit to it and to live by it. Oh, they could have said, Paul, who do you think you are? Paul, I... Have you seen the storm? That doesn't really look, I'm not sure what you heard is really true, Paul. But when Paul declared the truth of what God had spoken and they submitted themselves to the word of God, they got where God said they were going. Oh, I know the ship broke apart and some swam to shore and some floated on the wreckage. But everybody lived and everybody got where God said they were going to get. And when Jesus put the disciples in that boat, he told them at the beginning of the storm, you're going to the other side. Your end is determined. And what the enemy is trying to do is use circumstances to suffocate your faith until you are more influenced by the agenda and the voice of Herod than the voice of God. Until your conversation is governed by case counts and numbers and protocol and frustrations and anger and anxiety and not by what God is saying. Pressure all around us. But you have to know the truth because the truth will make you free. See, in 2 Corinthians 10, Paul talks to us about this thing called strongholds. Something that literally takes a hold on your mind strongly. He uses three words. He talks about thoughts, knowledge, and imaginations. You see, Paul starts at the highest level, imaginations, and works his way down. But how a stronghold is built... Is actually from the bottom up. So it starts like this. You just have a thought. Well, this COVID thing is pretty frustrating. and Nobody can really get the Holy Ghost without laying hands on them. And nobody can get the Holy Ghost wearing a mask. And so that thought becomes a knowledge or a way of thinking. You come to church and you lift your hands and you clap. But you really didn't come with expectation. Because your faith was trapped to a paradigm that you were comfortable or familiar with. So you think you can get to the other side by staying in the boat. But there came a point in the storm. Jesus said, Peter, I'm going to invite you out of the boat. I'm going to invite you to walk with me in a dimension that others have not walked. See, your faith can give you access to places where the kingdom operates in an unhindered manner. But the circumstances of the present day are like a grip on your faith, suffocating the life of the Spirit from you. And now that way of thinking, it takes the expectation out of the people of God. We come, we're thankful to come, we're glad for what we can do, but we're really not looking for somebody to get the Holy Ghost. We're not really looking for miracles to happen. We're just, man, we're just crawling by, just taking, taking what we can get. I mean, ultimately... Your way of thinking becomes an imagination. You know what an imagination is? It's something you think is true and live as if it is true, even though it's not. All the parents in the house, you know this. You've watched your kids do this. You give them a stick and they think it's a sword. They get those toys on the floor and they enter into another world. Sawyer told us, I like going to the mission house because I feel like I'm on a mission. See, the power of their imagination takes them into a realm where they begin to live and interact with their surroundings as though something is real, even though it's not. 
And so you come to church bound by that stronghold in your mind. Sown by the circumstances you have lived through. And you think, well, God's not going to do this. This could never happen. It's not true. I preached in Paris a couple months ago. Seven people came forward. Seven people had masks. Actually, everybody had masks on, but the seven who came forward all had their masks on. They lifted up their hands. Nobody laid hands on them. And all seven of them received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, there's a place we can go where the kingdom can operate unhindered. That's the prophecy of Isaiah 9 and 6. And that's why the spirit of our age is so threatened. But you hear me. Our leaders aren't bad people. Most of them just don't know what to do. And the spirit of fear that the enemy has used from the beginning that has always worked through human agencies and structures and governments not because they're bad people but because we're human. It works through those systems. And the fear that influences them projects itself on us until we start questioning God and thinking differently about God than the truth would have us think. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. I'm talking to somebody in this room today who you have allowed kingdom opportunities to pass you by because you have been distracted by the circumstances. Jesus has walked through your world just like he walked through Jericho, but you were distracted by external pressures and circumstances that you missed your moment. You missed your opportunity. And I'm preaching to you today. God is calling us to a realignment of vision and focus. To, to renew our faith and our commitment. And inviting us into a place where we move not by circumstance. Not by the word of humans. But by the divine word of God. Where we get with God and get direction from God. Insight from God. That orders our steps and directs our ministry. It could be that God would say to you, go knock on that neighbor's door. You don't know the struggle they're going through. You don't know the pressures that their marriage is enduring. Oh, they could ignore that when they were working nine to five separate jobs. I'm talking to somebody in the Holy Ghost right now. You don't know the trauma in their family and the pressures in their marriage because they're both having to work from home and deal with They're navigating uncharted territory. You don't know what it would do for a child of God to knock on their door and say, can I pray for you? I was walking down the street in uh, Nakuru, Kenya a few weeks ago. And I saw a lady sitting in the doorway of her house. And I said to the young man with me, I said, when you look at her, what do you feel? He said, I don't know. I said, I'll tell you what I feel. I said, she is so bound by shame that she won't even look us in the eye. She feels so insecure about herself that, that she's hesitant to even look and smile and greet us. I said, Jimna, let's go talk to her. And we walked over there and I began to speak to her and talk to her. I said, is there anything in your life that we could pray with you about? Is there anything that we could ask Jesus to minister to your life? And she said, I have a case in the courts from mistakes in my past. It's been two years and I'm nervous that it's going to have a, a negative outcome and affect my family. And I said, look, Jesus... Jesus is the perfect judge. Jesus rules all the courts of the world. I said, let's pray right now. And I reached out and took her hand. Her name was Margaret. And I began to pray. I said, God, I'm praying for Margaret in this situation. Lord, I'm asking as the perfect judge and the ruler of all the courts that you will move upon the hearts of those that you must move upon. That you will move the papers that must be moved. And I opened my eyes and I could see tears welling up on the inside of her eye. I stopped praying. I said, Margaret, do you feel that? She said, yeah. I said, that's Jesus letting you know He loves you. That your mistakes and your shame and all those lies of insecurity that you've been wrestling with don't stop God from coming to you if you'll just reach out to Him. 
tears are rolling down her cheeks at this point. I said, have you ever heard about being filled with the Holy Spirit? She hadn't. She had heard the phrase but didn't know anything about being filled with the Holy Ghost or speaking in other tongues. And so I grabbed my Bible and went to Acts chapter 2 and very quickly showed her that this was in the Word of God. I said, Margaret, right now, if you will lift up your hands and begin to say hallelujah to the Lord, I will lay my hand on your forehead and God is going to fill you with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this will be the answer to what you're looking for. This will be the help that you need. It wasn't two minutes later that standing in the doorway of her house Margaret was speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God filled her let me just be honest with you because this is where the Lord has wrecked my paradigm in the past year and a half if you would have asked me two years ago to minister to somebody or where somebody was going to be saved you know what I would have done I would have invited them to church I would have brought them here on Sunday I would have brought them to the altar and I would have hoped to God that we got the breakthrough we needed so they could get what they needed to get. But let me tell you what's happening right now. The circumstances in our world, the ever-increasing complexities of our day, and the pressures that we are all facing are making it more difficult. But the prophecy doesn't change. The kingdom and the government of God will have no end. There's no law in human government. There's no policy that can stop the kingdom of God. But what it might require is you address the deficiency of your faith and change your thinking about how this is going to happen. Every person who receives the gift of the Holy Ghost in this city, it's not going to happen on a Sunday service. It's not going to happen in these altars. My aunt came to my parents' house the other night. I was sitting on the other side of the living room as she was talking about not being able to work since July because pain in her body. And as I was sitting there in the chair, I felt the Spirit of God rush to me. And I knew, I thought, oh God, if I don't get up and pray for her right now, I'll have to repent when she leaves. And so as she was walking out the door, I walked over and I said, can I pray for you right now? And she said, yes. We laid hands on her and began to pray that the pain would be gone and the issue would be corrected. That employment would be restored. Why? Because I can't always do it right here. And what's happening right now is there's a lot of people that are asking God to stop the storm. And yeah, God could do that. But you know what else God could do? God could say, Peter, if you'll get out of the boat, I'll actually let you walk on the storm with me. I'll show you that people can get the Holy Ghost in living rooms, in dining rooms, in parking lots. I'll show you that miracles can happen when there's no music and no crowd. I left Margaret's house, walked about 50 feet down the street, and there was an old lady who knew that we were praying for people. She said, come in my house. Come in my house. I want you to, to share the word of the Lord with us. And she gathered her neighbors, and there were four, three or four of them sitting in the living room. And we began to talk about the things of God. and said, is there anything in your life that I can pray with you that Jesus would minister to you and help you? And, See, she wanted to make it about everybody else because that tends to be what we like to do. Well, pray for my son. Pray. For and at some point, you've got to allow Jesus to address the issue in your life, blind Bartimaeus. And she was sitting in her couch, and I let her talk about all the other people she wanted to pray for. And I said, well, I noticed when we were walking in, you seemed to have back pain. I mean, she was hunched right over. She couldn't even stand straight. She said, yes, I have an issue with my spine. I said, well, we're going to pray right now, and Jesus is going to heal her. So we began to pray, and you could feel the power of God moving in her living room. And I'm going to be honest with you. Living room is a generous term. Some of us probably wouldn't have taken the time to sit in that environment because it was anything but comfortable. It was anything but clean. But see, Jesus shows up in those environments, too. We began to pray, and I could feel the power of God, and she was sitting on that couch, and we stopped praying, and I said, how do you feel? So I, I, I feel better. I said, well, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take your hand, and we're going to pray again. But this time when we pray, I want you to stand up. And as we begin to pray, she stood up off that couch, but her back wasn't crooked anymore. 
As she stood up, her back was perfectly straight. And I'm telling you, the look upon her face was absolute shock when she realized that Jesus had straightened her spine. Those opportunities are all around you. They're across from the aisle of you. When you go to work, they're in the cubicle beside you. They're in the coworker you sit with on your lunch break. They're with the people you cross paths with in Tim Hortons. The waitress at the restaurant that everybody else is being rude to because they don't like wearing masks. They don't like showing papers. They don't like doing this. She's just waiting for somebody to love her. Somebody who not bound by the spirit of fear, but has power, love, and a sound mind. To look at this objectively with the wisdom of God and the right motive and the ability to minister to hurting people. I'm telling you, I know your faith has been under attack, but somebody hear me. The next dimension of growth that God will grant this church will not come simply through Sunday services. The circumstances are too great. But you hear me today. If you will hear the word of God. And you will listen to the voice of the spirit. He will call you like he did Peter. To step out of the boat. Out of the place of comfort. See for most of us. The greatest struggle. Is not the circumstance. For most of us. The greatest struggle. Is our complacency. It's our comfort. Because our faith is comfortable in the paradigm that we are familiar with. In the context that is most common to us. But when circumstances push us to change our way of thinking. And take the ministry that we have delegated to others back to ourselves. And that we have left in a building to other places. Our uncomfortableness causes us to question God. When in reality, it's not God that should be questioned. But us. Jesus rises from his sleep. And says oh you. Of little faith. The storm is not the issue. The circumstances are not the problem. Hey I'm as human as you are. I've been on 10 hour plane rides with three kids and masks. It's not fun. I don't like it. But none of this stops God. If we don't let it stop our faith. You shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. There's power in this room today. Because we preach that you've got to repent of your sin. There's power in this room. Because we preach you've got to be baptized in Jesus name. For the remission of your sins. There's power here today. Because there's people all across this sanctuary. That have been filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And we preach that it's available and it's necessary. We know the truth. And God says, because you know it, because you declared it, Bartimaeus, come and tell me what you need. See, your declaration of truth gives you access to the court of the king where God will actually ask you, tell me what you want. And we have a choice. Do we say, God, I really love you to stop blowing the wind. Calm the wave. And I've done a little bit of that too. But I'm going to be honest with you. There's people all over the world who have been asking God for almost two years to stop this. If God wanted it stopped, it would be stopped. And so in the midst of the frustration and the distraction, we're going to have to change our way of thinking a little bit. And if he's going to let the wind keep blowing and the storm keep raging, we're going to have to say, God, I need a word of direction. I need insight. I need understanding. And it might just be that God says to you like he said to Peter, come. Because what Peter was really asking for in that moment, when he said, if it's really you, bid me to come on the water, he was saying, the storm that is causing me fear, the storm that is rocking my boat, the storm that's causing me to be overcome with anxiety and uncertainty, the storm that's troubling me doesn't seem to be troubling you. 
So if it's really you and you have authority over this storm, I'm asking you to let me share in that authority. And so God says, all right, come on. And he starts walking on water. And it could just be that God is calling us to walk on water a little bit. To do some things. Maybe you've never knocked on a door before. Maybe you've never reached out and taken the hand of a, of a cashier or a waiter or a waitress and in a moment of need prayed for them. Or maybe you've never done anything. Maybe you're going to have to walk on water this week. And matter of fact, I tell somebody, you're going to have opportunity in the next few days. And here's how you're going to know. You're going to be sitting somewhere. You're going to be doing something. And it's going to be like a wind starts to blow out of nowhere. Just like happened to me sitting in my parents' living room. Like the Spirit of God just rushes to you. And a thought comes to your mind. I must do this. It'll be followed by a second thought. I don't know, that's uncomfortable. Hey, it is uncomfortable walking on water. Because science says it's not possible. But with God, all things are possible. Stand together with me. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. You shall know the truth, not a truth. Do not justify your distraction because something is true. You need to fix your eyes on the truth. Because the truth is superior to a truth or any truth. It's the truth. And while our world is overcome with fear and uncertainty. Well, there's questions for which nobody really has answers. What people need is somebody who knows the truth, because the truth will make you free. Sometimes God changes your circumstance, but a lot of the time, God just changes you. And at the end of the day, what really is the better story? That God stop the wind, that the waters go calm, or that in spite of all the adversity and all of the struggle, the king keeps going forward. Come on, that's the witness of the Holy Ghost blowing through this room right now. In the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody, let the Holy Ghost work on you right now. Come on, you spent a lot of time looking at the storm, a lot of time talking about the storm. And what you don't know is the spirit of fear has worked through that. And your thinking has been affected, your faith has been affected. But the Lord has come today to help you out. Come on, don't question God right now. Don't question God. His word hasn't changed. He's still pouring out His spirit. People's sins are still being washed away. Miracles, signs, and wonders are still happening. Yes, yes, yes. In the name of Jesus. We cast down every thought, every way of thinking contrary to the truth of who you are. Contrary to the truth that you have declared, we cast it down right now. Every fear, every anxiety, every depression, 
every thought that the enemy would sow to hinder the advancement of the kingdom, we cast it down right now. We cast it down right now. We take it captive to the obedience of Christ. We do not overcome it with fear or with anger, but with love, with joy, and with peace. For this is the kingdom of God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, as we're praying right now, there's some of you that have had names come to your mind. Faces have come to your mind. That's the Spirit of the Lord impressing upon you those that He is calling you to go to. Those that you have opportunity to minister to. I know it's a little bit uncomfortable to get out of the boat because the boat seems safe. The boat seems familiar. Come on, I wish you'd just close your eyes and enter into the presence of God. Not worrying about anybody around you, not looking at who's beside you or in front of you. Come on, this is you and the Lord. This is you and the Lord right now. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let your kingdom come in CCC. Let your kingdom come in Fredericton. Let your kingdom come in my heart, in my family. Come on, as persecution came upon the early church, as those external pressures and those challenges were becoming ever difficult, they prayed, grant us boldness. It wasn't a boldness so much to resist government and to resist leaders. That's not what it was. It was a boldness to resist the comfort of what was familiar and the comfort of their flesh to overcome their own way of thinking and the old way of doing it. Because there was a dimension of growth and harvest and revival that would only be obtained if the way they were doing ministry changed just a little bit. When you're going through the grocery store and you see that cashier stop and move because you know she's got back pain. It's as simple as saying, I notice you look like your back is hurting a little bit. Yes, yes it is. Well, I've seen God do many miracles. Would you mind if I pray for you? You don't need to lay your hand on her forehead. You don't need to scream in tongues or shout. You just need to demonstrate your faith. Get out on the water. Walk a little bit in that new dimension. I'm telling somebody in the Holy Ghost today. I'm telling this church I feel the spirit of prophecy on me. You will not fill this building with Sunday services. You'll not fill it with midweek Bible studies. That's a part of the process. Don't get me wrong. If the doors are open, my God, you ought to be here. Be faithful to the fellowship of the body. Be faithful to the house of God. But hear me, the idea that every miracle that's going to happen has to happen here. Or every person that's going to get the Holy Ghost has to happen here. It's time we shake off that way of thinking. God, grant us boldness to overcome what is safe, familiar, and comfortable. Because here's what I'll tell you. The same frustrations you have, the same questions you have, the same fear you fought, the same anxiety you've battled, every other person in this city has battled it too. And what they need is somebody not bound by fear. Not operating under the word of Herod, but under the word of God. Somebody who can come with the power, the ability, but also the right motive. We're not just pushing back and protesting for the sake of this. We're doing it. 
because we love people and the kingdom must go forward. And we can do it with a mask on. We can do it with distance. But hear me, we've got to keep doing it. Oh, God. I'm telling you, there's some people in this room, you have coffee with people every week. You meet them every week. They're old friends. They don't even come to church. They've never been here. They're old friends. Maybe you've never even invited them here because you know they won't come. That's okay. Because God goes with you. And rather than trying to bring the kingdom them to the kingdom, you can actually take the kingdom to them. But you have to ask God to give you boldness. Not as much to push back against the circumstances that are external, but that are internal. Because I'm telling you from an introvert that found a very comfortable place of ministry behind pulpits like this for 10 years, that in the past few months, God has absolutely wrecked my paradigm of how I think about ministry and the opportunities I look for. Because I realize with the ever-increasing struggles of our day, I can't do what God called me to do only in this setting. And so I'm preaching to you as an introvert going through a reform after a decade of ministry. That we don't bold, need boldness so much to push back on the pressures that are around us as much as the comfort that is within us. The familiarity, the idea that we box God in to this certain way of ministry. God help us. One more time, would you lift your hands to the Lord? Alamo shaki alamo kotorabahai. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. Help us right now to overcome. Overcome our flesh. Overcome ourself. Overcome comfort and familiarity. Take us out on the water. Take us out in the storm. Let us share in your power and your authority. We know the truth. We declare the truth. Now let the truth Make us free. I speak freedom to every mind in this room right now. I speak freedom to every heart, to every distracted mind, every weary mind. I speak freedom to every family that is struggling through the pressures of this season. She'll know the truth. Jesus, you are the truth. The truth shall make us free. Yes, 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 yes. I know we're lingering here a little bit, but if Jesus was walking through Jericho, he was going to make sure he got his attention. And this is your moment to make sure that you recalibrate, you get what you need. Come on, if, you're, if your eyes are buried in the Facebook, Facebook news feed, and if your nose is buried in global news and CBC, you are going to feed that fear in your life. It's going to cloud your mind. You'll have no direction to hear from God or walk as the Spirit leads or do as the Spirit leads. But if you remove those distractions, and God will grant you a word just like he did to Joseph, just like he did to Paul. And that word will get you exactly where God wants you to be. Oh, help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. Thank 
Come on, if he's going to let the storm blow, then I'm going to say, God, if you're going to leave the storm, if you're not going to change the circumstance, change me. Let me see with your eyes, hear with your ears, feel what you feel. That I would walk not by flesh, but by the Spirit. Hallelujah. 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 In the name of Jesus. Pastor Jack. I'm telling you, I said this already, but I feel this in the Holy Ghost. In just the next few days, God is going to grant many of you an opportunity to practice what I've just challenged you with. You'll be somewhere, could be the grocery store, could be at the drive through window at Tim Hortons, could be sitting with family who's far from God over the holidays. And you'll be sitting there, and you'll feel the Spirit of the Lord rush to you. You know, when you're in a church service like this, and the Holy Ghost falls upon you, and you feel compelled to get out of your seat, or you get up and start waving your hands, or you want to shout, or you dance, or it's that same thing. But the response is different. You're not going to take off and cut a jig in the checkout line at the superstore. But when you feel the Spirit of the Lord rush to you like that, that is the Holy Ghost trying to tell you there's ministry around you right now. There's opportunity. And you've got to look for it. Because there will be God-given opportunities that comes through settings like that that you'll never get here. Well, they've got ideas about you and, and Penny. They, see, they're bound by an imagination that keeps them from coming here. That's why God said, go, go, go. And if you will respond, when you feel the Spirit of the Lord rush to you in those moments, I tell you, God will confirm His work. Because these signs follow them that believe. Believe is not a confession. Believe is an action. And if you know the truth, if you live with the truth, and the freedom that you walk in goes where you go. And I promise you, there's a lot of people in this city right now who are looking for freedom. They think they're looking for freedom from circumstance. And I hope to God it comes because we all want it. But the real freedom they need is not from circumstance. It's from self. That they can be delivered from self and from bondage and from sin and know the truth who is Jesus because the truth will make you free. Let's lift up our hands to the Lord. Let's reach out to God right now.